evening. Well, good evening. Sorry for getting us started late. We had our uh, bow the knee introduction and uh, brought, brought back a lot of memories. Had a great turnout for that. And uh, looking forward to put that together. If you weren't able to make it uh, to the practice, but you wanna be a part of it, uh, it's not too late. Just uh, let me know. And I'd love to uh, get you involved with the choir or in the drama. But uh, thankful to put that together this year. Well, let's all stand. We're going to sing glory to his name. We'll just sing two verses, the first and the last. Glory to his name. Let's all sing together as we sing. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was a blood applied, glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet, I pour soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood of mine. Sing, you may be seated. Well, good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight and looking forward to the video here. We're going to try to economize on time uh, since we're getting a little bit of a late start, but between the trustees uh, meeting and, uh, and then the bow the knee presentation that many of you saw, um, we're running a little bit behind. I um, want to make sure that uh, everybody that wanted one got one of these New Testaments. And we appreciate uh, Brother Steve King, one of our Gideons, making these available. It's just like, exactly like the Gideon New Testament. Uh, it is a Gideon New Testament, in, in, in essence, without the logo on the front. So uh, uh, I want to make sure that you got one there in the back. If you didn't get one, I want you to have that. And uh, forgive me for not mentioning this morning that Brother Ray Lewis is having knee surgery tomorrow morning. Um, he will have arthroscopic knee surgery up at the Village's Hospital, uh, the uh, outpatient surgery side of that hospital. Um, so be praying for that, that uh, that would be a success. Um, and then uh, Mr. Bevel is in the hospital with a UTI. Glenn, uh, Etta's husband, so pray for him, please, if you would. Um, Erica Krusiger, uh, want to pray for Erica, battling covid um, Timothy and Jennifer uh, Curtan for illness. Um, Rhonda Painter, uh, understand the procedure went, went well for John, her tracheotomy, and uh, continue to pray for her. And then Jerry Winuck uh, for his uh, healing, and Philip Swadell, uh, my mother-in-law, uh, for her UTI uh, issue. And then, of course, Brother Ray. Remember also our missionaries of the week, Bill and Sharon Smith, missionaries to Brazil, and Mike and Becky Peterson, missionaries to Poland. Um, so we want to remember these in our prayers, our upcoming conference. Um, so uh, let's, uh, uh, let's go ahead. Here's what we'll do. Have the ushers go ahead and come for our Sunday night offering, and then we'll just make a combination prayer here. We'll pray uh, for these and for our offering, and, uh, and we'll get started because we want to get into the video. We also have a presentation here in just a little bit. Uh, following the video, I want uh, Brother Steve to come up and just give you some tips on using these Gideon New Testaments because they have helps in the front and things in the back, uh, plan of salvation and so forth. So, um, yeah, so uh, do you want to come lead us in prayer, Brother Richard? 
Okay, all right, come ahead, brother. Amen. Amen. God bless. It's an honor to pray. Thank you so much. And learning the new signals. <laughs> Well, Father, we come before you tonight in your house, and we just give you all the praise, honor, and glory for everything you do for us. And we just pray that these tithes and offerings will always be done according to your will and, and, and spent in a wise way that will bring more souls to know the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. further along we'll know all about it it reminds me of uh, when the Lord Jesus washed Peter's feet and he said to Peter remember Peter said you'll never wash my feet and then remember what Jesus said to him what I do thou knowest not now but thou shalt know hereafter and uh, that song makes me think of that um, and uh, we're just going to go right into the video part from here. So, ladies, you can have a seat. Thank you, Bonita, Donita, for playing that wonderful offertory. Further along, we'll know all about it. Further along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. He'll make it better all by and by, or he'll make it anyway. We'll understand it, right? <laughs> right now, we don't, we don't, you know, sometimes, you know, have you ever seen anybody doing needlepoint? And you look underneath and it looks like a tangled mess and you look up top and you see a pattern emerging. And I think sometimes that's like our life. We look up and we say, Lord, I don't see anything but a bunch of tangled mess. And then if God says, if you could come up here and see it from my viewpoint, you'd see what I'm doing. So we don't always understand why God uh, weaves dark threads in and so forth, but we'll understand it all by and by, right? And because the master weaver has a plan and we just need to say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Um, all right, so I want to mention again this book by Bill Fay, Share Jesus Without Fear, paperback. Um, if you have a chance to get this off Amazon or Lifeway or someplace, it's, uh, it's really worth its weight in gold because there's a lot in here that is not covered in the video. Um, so uh, answers to objections, different things. Um, it's, if you're interested, it's well worth, I think it's $9.95 or something like that. It's not much. Um, it's, uh, yeah, $9.99. Um, well worth getting, a uh, wonderful resource that you can mark up yourself. Um, just want to mention that. Um, so before we get into session three, um, just want to, because we had a missionary last week, so it's been two weeks since we showed session two, and I just want to just uh, touch on those five questions that, um, do you remember what they were? Number one, do you have any spiritual beliefs? Not do you believe in God, that might be considered offensive. But, you know, we want people to talk and we listen. Um, 
Uh-huh, yeah, mm, okay. Yeah, so do you have any spiritual beliefs? Question number two is, to you, who is Jesus? And we're looking for a religious versus a relational. Um, you know, or oh, he's the son of God, or is he my savior? You know, you're kind of looking for that who, to you, who is Jesus? And some, they might say he's just a good, he was a good man, or he was a good teacher, or whatever. Third question is, do you believe in heaven or hell? Heaven and hell. Do you believe in heaven and hell? And then the fourth question, if you died today, where would you go? And then if they say heaven, why? And then the fifth question, of course, is, if what you believe were not true, would you want to know? And uh, if they say no, what do you do? You stop. You don't necessarily walk away, but you stop. If they say no, you stop. And then, and then if they say, well, aren't you going to tell me? Well, you said you didn't want to know. Well, I do want to know. Okay. You know, so... So those are the five questions. Um, remember, he said, uh, leave, uh, leave Big Bertha home. Uh, in other words, you know, most of the time, you're not going to have it with you anyway. Have a little pocket testament, your little, uh, little dagger, I call it, your concealed weapon, uh, <laughs> and, and have it marked. And remember, faith comes by hearing, so you want them to read the verse out loud. The verse that's highlighted, you want them to read it out loud. And then you're going to ask them, what does this say to you? Remember, that's based on Jesus' remarks. What says the law? How do you read it? So what does it say to you? And then you, you gauge where they're at spiritually if they're understanding it. So um, Tonight, we're going to see a way to share Jesus, and this first session is 14 minutes long, so we kind of, that's one reason why there's actually three or four segments to this video um, that all total this thing's going to be about 40 minutes. So I don't want to keep you all night. It's uh, already 20 after, and I know we're not watching the clock, but I want to be cognizant of your time. So um, we'll, we'll take a little bit of a break in between these segments, but this first segment is Let the Bible Speak. And uh, this is encouraging to me because this is the power right here, the Word of God. This is the power. Um, and the Holy Spirit of God uses the Word of God to convict the sinner of his need of Christ. It's not you and I, it's the Word of God. You know, let me just share this because it just, this verse just came to my mind. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, when Paul came to Corinth, he said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is 1 Corinthians 2, 3. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So it's not, it's not our slick presentation. It's not our salesmanship or talk, talk, you know, talking ability. or persu It's the powers in the word of God. The powers in the gospel, and that's what we're there to share. So this first section of the video, guys, you ready to go with that? Um, good, thank you, is let the Bible speak. You have session three outline, so um, there's really nothing for you to fill in here. Just listen and watch, and then when we get to part two, there's some five questions that lead to a point of decision that, uh, that you'll fill in some blanks for. All right, let's go. Now that you've learned the principles of how to use scripture, I know some of you are saying, I'm never going to remember all these verses. So I'm going to show you the neatest little cheat sheet you've ever seen, but it's okay, it's a Christian one. 
we're going to teach you a way to mark your Bible. First of all, we're going to use a yellow highlighter on the verse that we want people to read out loud. But while they're reading that verse out loud, I'm going to have you mark in the white margin nearest your tummy the next verse. So if you can remember one verse, they're going to be convinced you've been to seminary. You're going to have a rabbit trail all through Scripture. So backing it up a second, I'm going to have them read Romans 3.23 out loud. I'm going to say to them, what does it say to you? The usual response is, Bill, all have sinned. I say, that's great. Turn the page. I turn to Romans 6.23. That verse happens to say that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, how am I going to have you read it? That's right, I'm going to have you read it out loud. But I'm going to add a couple of dimensions to give this verse some power of understanding in people's lives. I take and I kind of mark it in an unusual way. Where it says in your Bible that the wages of sin, take the word sin and underline it in your Bible. And then where your Bible says, the gift of God is eternal life. If your version says in, circle in. And here's how I do that. I'm going to have the person read the verse out loud. I'm going to say, what's it say to you? And you say, well, if you sin, you die. I said, right. Did you notice that in my Bible, see, it's always me I'm pointing at. I'm never pointing and scolding you. I said, it reminds me in my Bible by underlining the word sin that there's no S at the end of it. God does not say for two sins or five sins you'll send me to hell. He says one. And if you happen to have a verse of Scripture that says in, in your translation, I have mine circled because it reminds me I am to be in a relationship, not in a religion. And the reason I'm so convinced that using the Word of God is so powerful, I can remember several years ago, I was asked to share with a, about a 15-year-old girl who was in uh, a group home for murder. And when I went in and asked her those first five questions that everyone has learned earlier, it was very clear to me no one had ever shared with her. Nothing about the Lord, heaven, hell. She knew nothing about nothing. But the whole key was she gave me permission to get to the Word of God. We just happened to get to Romans 6.23. And I had her read the verse out loud. And I said, what does it say to you? And I'll never forget her answer. She said, I need to ask God to forgive me for all my sins and invite Jesus Christ into my life. Now we know the verse doesn't say that, but where did she get the answer for salvation from? The Holy Spirit. I didn't say to her, now hold it young lady, because I got about another five verses to go. See, the advantage of sharing this way is I'm in the page turning business and if God wants to show someone the truth of salvation in one verse or 100, that's my Heavenly Father's business. What I do from these two verses is I head right over to John 3.3. 3. And I'm going to do an interesting thing here because I have been fairly dogmatic about saying, have someone read the verse out loud and then always say to them, what does it say to you? But that would be too simple, so I'm going to give you one exception today. And here's how I'm going to have you remember the simple exception. I'm going to have you take your Bible and above here in the margin where you've been writing the verses, I'm going to have you put an X and I'm going to have you draw a cross and I'm going to have you write the next verse, which would be John 14, 6. And here's why I'm going to tell you to do this. I say to this person that has just read the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And they've now caught that it's relationship versus religion. Say, I'll bet you're wondering how you get that relationship with Jesus. And always they go, yeah. So I go over and I say, let me show you how that happens. A man just like you walked up to Jesus and said, by the way, basically, how do you get to heaven? Ah, oh, this man was religious, pretty moral person just like you. And here was Jesus' answer. And I open my Bible and I'm going to have him read John 3.3 3 out loud. But here's the exception. That's your reminder. I am not going to ask him what it says to him. And let me give you a biblical reason for that. Jesus, I don't believe, wanted Nicodemus to understand. 
his answer, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. It just freaked out in our language today, Nicodemus. He basically said, I'm old, my mother's old, I can't go back in my mother's womb. I mean, what in the world am I going to do? So here's what I do. I simply take something, if I'm at a table or I have my pen in my pocket, and I make the sign of a cross. And I say to people, by the way, do you remember or know why Jesus came to die? Most people will say, even if they're very pagan, will say, well, he came to die for sin. I say, that's right. Remember the verse of scripture you just read? That the payment of sin is death. And they usually stick the word death in there for me. And I say, correct. So when Jesus got on the cross and he took upon himself your sin, my sin, sin of the whole world, someone had to pay for our sin. And so Jesus died on that cross. And I said, remember in the verse you just read, see, it's only been one verse that they just read, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I hold up that pen or fork or whatever I hold up. I say, if I offered you this gift and you really deeply needed my pen today, what would you have to do if you wanted it? Funny thing kind of happens. The Adam's apple starts to bob up and down. I've never really understood the phenomenon. Almost 70% of the time they'll say I'd have to pay for it. I smile and say, no, gift is free. They'd say, well, I have to thank you. I said, well, that would be nice, but the pen is still in my hand. All of a sudden they get it. They know exactly what, what I'm after. They'll eventually say I have to take it, accept it, or receive it. And I'll say, well, why don't you? And they'll take the pen out of my hand. And I'll say, see, the cross is just like my pen does not become your gift to you're willing to take it, accept it, or receive it. If you're watching, you're going to see a funny little click in their eye. It's almost like, that's it? I said, that's it. The gospel's so simple, it only requires one thing, to receive it. And right now, almost everything picks up breakneck speed. It's almost like the whole plate is cleared, their understanding is open, and I proceed to John 14, 6. And I'm going to have them read that verse out loud. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I'm going to say, what does it say to you? And they're going to say, well, Jesus is the only way. I said, right. I turn on over. I'm going to begin to walk through the verses of Scripture. You see, I think it's important, some of the verses that we have that we're using. For example, several years ago, I never used 2 Corinthians 5.15. But it bothered me that there was a possibility that someone might be making a decision that might not be a surrendered conversion to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I wanted to be careful since I became so comfortable watching the Lord Jesus Christ work in the lives of so many people that I presented the gospel with a clear understanding with the elements that must be there for salvation, the recognition of sin, who and what they have violated. I want those elements to be in there always. And if I get someone that's not even sure about that, I'll always go over there to Matthew and I'll open up the verse where it says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And for someone in this culture that may be struggling with the whole issue of what is sin, I'll say to them, have you ever loved God with all your whole soul, mind, heart, soul, mind, and strength? They go, no. I said, now you know what sin is. But see, without recognition of sin, there is no purpose or need for a Savior. But that's why God gave us the schoolmaster, the Ten Commandments, because all of us have violated every commandment. We have broken every law of God. And I want people to understand that element so that they can see the solution, which is the cross and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I use verses in terms of Romans 10, where all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So I want that the deepest scourge of the earth, the most absolute awful sinner, will understand that he is never too awful to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. That is why in my verses I incorporate there must be some element of turning from sin and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me go back and just deal with a sequence of verses that we teach in Share Jesus Without Fear. The first verse we use because we want to deal with the whole issue of sin is Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
I want to deal with a penalty of sin, which is Romans 6, 23, that for one sin, one time, the bottom line is it's the pit. It's eternal separation from God. But I want to show that how we enter the relationship with Christ, and that is done through John 3.3, 3, where you must be born anew, born again, to enter the kingdom of heaven. I want to show them the narrowness of the gospel, the absolute exclusivity of it. John 14.6, where Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. But I always love going to Romans 10, verses 9 through 11, because it's one of my favorite passages of Scripture, because it reminds me that even someone with the depth of sin that I had in my life, that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It is an incredible presentation of the gospel, all in 9 through 11 there, of forgiveness and the willingness to turn and admit my sin to the Lord Jesus Christ. But not only turning to Christ, but I got to turn from sin. And that's why I become so comfortable using 2 Corinthians 5.15, which talks so clearly that we must turn from and turn to. Some people would use the word surrender, but it's the purposing in my heart that I no longer want to live for myself, but for the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is still a choice that everyone has to make. The choice is to accept or the choice is to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why I particularly become comfortable using Revelation 3.20. It is just such a beautiful picture of Jesus knocking at the door and someone making the choice to invite him in. I mean, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anyone who opens the door, Jesus will come in, sup with them, and they with him. It's a marvelous verse of showing the freedom because love is never forced. God always gives us the choice to choose or reject his saving grace. Does it ever happen that when someone's reading the scripture, it's always clear to them? No, not always. And I have learned a very simple way to avoid the conflict and to let the Holy Spirit teach them exactly what that verse says. Let's suppose that they had just read, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I said, what does it say to you? And for some reason, spiritual warfare, confusion, they don't have a clear understanding of what that verse means. I never correct them. I never play master theologian. I never try to fix them. I just simply turn to them and say, read it again. I call it the read it again principle. Whenever someone does not understand a verse of Scripture, I simply say to them, would you please just read it again? It is so much fun to watch the Holy Spirit just take them and teach them. I go back, I couldn't teach myself. Why would I expect to teach you? So please just read it again. Right. Did you get that? Uh, two thoughts. Um, D.L. Moody used Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. That's the verse he alluded to when the uh, master of the law came to Jesus and he said, what's the great commandment? And Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And so D.L. Moody would use that with people who weren't convinced they were a sinner and he would show that verse and say, what is the first and great commandment? And they would say, to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. And he said, well, then what would you say would be the greatest sin? And they would say, well, I suppose the failure to keep that commandment. And then he would say, have you kept it? So that is a kind of a way of using um, God's law as a way to convict you know, that's the first commandment. Have you kept it? Um, the other thing is the Revelation 3.20 verse. Um, some of you remember uh, Brother Orlando, Fury Orlando, who was one of our deacons and now in heaven. But in his New Testament, he actually had a picture. Um, he would turn to Revelation 3.20, and he actually had a picture of that artist portrait of Jesus knocking on the, on the door. 
Um, and that painting, as you know, depicts the door with no handle. And when that art was at first um, released, there were some critics who pointed out to the artist when he unveiled the portrait, wait a minute, you didn't finish it. You left something off. Well, what do you mean? Well, there's no doorknob on the door. And he said, no, that door pictures the human heart. It has to be open from the inside. And so Brother Fury had that picture right next to Revelation 3.20, and he would show them, see, this is Christ knocking on your heart's door. You have to open the door and ask him to come in. So just, you know, if you don't want to do that, that's fine. You may not, you know, but uh, it, was, it was the same size as this page. And, uh, and so he would show that to people. Just a couple of thoughts there um, on those uh, verses. And, you know, uh, for me, um, I've, I've used some of those verses. Um, I mainly, though, to be honest with you, have sticked with the Romans road because you don't have to go from book to book. You can pretty much just go Romans 5, uh, Romans uh, uh, 3.23. I sometimes start at Romans 3.10. Um, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. And, uh, and then Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8, and then go to Romans 10, 9, and 10, and 13. Um, I always try to also um, give them some assurance by going to 1 John 5.13. Uh, if they pray that sinner's prayer and, and ask Christ to save them, uh, take them to 1 John 5 and uh, try to show them that verse. So um, there's, you know, be a little flexible. There's no one size fits all um, approach. Um, but I like the fact that, um, you know, we don't, we don't want to hit them with 20 verses. Um, you know, just, I guess the old KISS principle, keep it simple. Yeah, I'm not going to say the, yeah. keep it simple dummy, but it's a word, that, it's a word that starts with S. So, um, but you know, that keep it simple. Don't, don't, you, we don't have to get really complicated, and we don't want to try to give them a course in theology. Um, so uh, now the next section deals with if you sense that God is doing something in their heart and the Holy Spirit's convicting them and the Word of God is convincing them of their need, um, then there's a, a path to lead them down uh, to get to that point of commitment and trusting Christ as their Savior. So that's this next section. Now we come to the part that Christians fear the most. How do you ask somebody to make a decision for Jesus Christ? We're going to teach you five simple questions that will allow them to know if their heart is open and ready to receive Jesus Christ. Well, first of all, remember, the first thing we did was we inserted some questions in people's lives. I call it some diagnostic questions where you could have asked one through five or inserted one of those questions into somebody's life and suddenly they gave us permission to open the Bible. That's our ultimate goal. We went through the scriptures. We asked people to read the verse out loud. We asked them what it said to them. If they didn't understand a verse, we didn't fix them. We just said, would you please read it again? We let the Holy Spirit deal with them. When we're done sharing all the verses, now we come to a part I often say that seems to make the Christian very nervous. Now, somehow the non-believer seems to be fine with this, but the Christian's afraid of the decision or the close. Because I think my Christian brother and sister once again thinks that he has to cause the conversion. And how I have learned to ask for a decision is through a series of five very simple questions. The first question, which everyone's heard a bunch of times, is, are you a sinner? But what I want everybody to notice is that the sequence of questions that I'm going to ask matches the sequence of verses that they just read. So the verses of Scripture prepare the heart for the questions you're going to ask. So remember, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Are you a sinner? Second question, do you want forgiveness of your sin? Third question, do you believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross for you, and rose again. Fourth question, the willingness to take your life and surrender it to Jesus Christ. The last question, are you ready to invite Jesus Christ into your life and into your heart? Now, there's two last important principles I want to teach. 
whenever you ask question number five, are you ready to invite Jesus Christ into your life and into your heart? There are two words, silence and pray. There's times I've often said I would really like to use the word shut up, but it's not a very nice word, but it makes a very strong point instead of the word silence. Whenever you ask question number five, are you ready to invite Christ in your life and in your heart, would you please go silent? Because I want you to think about what's happening. The 10 or 15 seconds of silence that go by to the person you've just asked this question to feels like 10 minutes. The Holy Spirit's working on them. The Word of God is working on them. If you're fortunate enough to have intercessors praying, they're working on them. The angels in heaven are rooting for you. And please do not get in God's way. Are you ready to invite Christ in your life and in your heart? And at the moment you go silent, I want you to start to pray in your mind. I don't close my eyes and get super spiritual. I look right at you and I can pray. I can pray and I'm begging God for your salvation. I'm taking the lead of the Holy Spirit because this is the most important question you've ever asked somebody. And it may be the most important question they'll ever hear in their whole life. They're about to make a decision to accept or reject. And you better take it serious enough to pray. All right, did you get those five questions? All right. Um, I've always liked the idea that when the fruit is ripe, you don't have to yank on it. Amen. And, uh, you know, one thing that we don't want to do when we're dealing with somebody is pressure them or pluck green fruit, if you understand what I'm saying. And uh, it, it's not up to us to do the saving. It's up to God to do the saving. And uh, so I like that. Be silent and just pray and wait for them to answer. Um, now there's times when someone might have an objection and or they might you know, throw up something uh, to get you off of that because when you're under conviction, that, that's, that's uncomfortable. And so sometimes people will throw up an objection. Well, what about the heathen in Africa? Or you know, some other question that really has nothing to do with what you're showing them, but they're trying to be evasive and kind of dodge the conviction because that, that's it may be uncomfortable so how do you handle objections that's the next section you've just learned to ask the five questions now there's only two choices, either yes or no. If it's yes, of course, we pray with them as they invite Christ in their life. But what if they say no? We're about to teach you the why principle. When you ask the fifth question, are you ready to invite Jesus Christ in your life and in your heart? There are only two possibilities. Yes, no. If they say yes, and the yes is from their heart, Guess what's happened? We have a new born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, I love praying a sinner's prayer. It's one of the wonderful desserts and privileges of my life. But what I am looking for is a decision based on a heart that has turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want conversion, not words. And when they say yes, and it's from that heart, I'll always pray. But how do you deal with the no. And it's really very simple. I use a very simple word called the why, W-H-Y word, or the why principle. And I kind of stole it from the psychologist. I figured out one day you go around paying them $100 an hour, and they don't know anything either, so they go around saying back to you, why do you feel this way? And we end up paying them to tell them. I've never quite figured it all out yet, but it must work. And so here I am, suddenly sitting with someone, I say, are you ready to invite the Lord Jesus Christ in your life and in your heart? They go, no. And I go, well, why? See, first of all, I'm not God. I don't have a clue why they've just told me no. So the best person to tell me is them. What if when you ask somebody if they're ready 
to invite Christ in their life and in their heart, they start firing objections. I'm not ready. What will my family think? I'll lose my friends. Well, you're going to be able to answer all of those objections. So I've often heard people say, well, I am not ready. I don't have a clue. I've shared my faith 10, 15,000 times or more, and I don't have a clue why they're not ready. But the best person to tell me is them. So I say, would you mind telling me, why are you not ready? And oftentimes they say something like, well, um, I, I, I've got to go check with my wife. Or they say something that sounds even dumb to them. And just kind of hearing it as they speak doesn't even make sense. Some of the other, quote, objections that, that I think I've heard several times that are fairly patterned are things like, well, um, Bill, I'm not sure that this is the only religion. Well, why? Well, aren't there a lot of religions in the world? No. They're really just two. Just two? Yes. Kind of think of it this way. In my left hand is every religion other than Christianity. And they all make two consistent claims. The first claim they make is that Jesus is not God. The second claim they make is that some effort on your part, could be diet, terrorist acts, good deeds, can get you from earth to heaven. Now, Christianity, which we'll call my other hand, says two opposite things. It says Jesus is God and that God had to come to us. We can't get to him. Now, I know one logical fact two opposites. Both can't be true. Now, they both could be wrong, but they both can't be true. I'll admit that if my left hand is true, it doesn't matter which of those religions you are, because they're all saying the same thing. And I'll admit that my faith would be in vain. But I'm wondering if all of them would be as honest to admit that if Christianity is true, that their faith is in vain. The other sometimes objection that I hear people simply bring up to me is, I'm not good enough. God couldn't forgive me. I've done too much that's wrong. And here's where I love the power of the Word of God. See, I would go right back to Romans 10, and I'd have them zero in on verse 11, where it says, anyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. And I'm going to have them read that verse. How? You bet, out loud. And I'm going to say, what's it say to you? And they almost always say, well, that includes me too, doesn't it? I said, you bet. Sometimes people say to me, well, Bill, does this mean I have to stop sleeping with my boyfriend? Let me give you an important principle. Whenever a specific sin comes up, they're under conviction of the Holy Spirit. Please don't you wimp away being afraid you'll lose a decision which won't be a conversion for the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, it was the young girl on the plane. Her first question was, does this mean relationship with my boyfriend must end? I said, if you're referring to a sexual relationship, the answer is yes. She said, I was afraid so. I said, you have a choice, don't you? She said, yes, I want to make it for Jesus. We must deal honestly. We must deal with the holiness of God. The other one that I hear people say in this generation is, Bill, I'm having too much fun. I say, ah, kind of the party animal, huh? A little old uh, party and a little old drugging, a little old drinking and a little old whatever. They go, yep. I'll tell you how I deal with that one. I simply turn to the person and I say, I want to make sure that I have shared the gospel clearly with you today. And I have one last question. See, for me, it's always a question. And I simply turn to them and I say, according to what you have read tonight, see, I'm always going back to the Bible for my authority. I don't care whether they believe it or not. It's my authority. According to what you've read today, tonight, and let's say you go out partying a little too hardy and you end up dead on the cement on a highway. From what you have read, where did the Bible say you'd go since you've rejected Jesus? And they will kind of hesitate a minute and they'll say, well, I'd go to hell. And I'd say, well, you just have a nice day. They'll drive carefully for about 48 hours. But the big step has been taken because they walk away knowing truth. Do I like it that anyone walks away from the cross of Jesus Christ? No, I hate it. But I will never 
force a decision to hear the words that would satisfy me and be unacceptable in heaven because a heart has not turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to give people permission that when someone is genuinely not ready, they're struggling, maybe it's the first time they've heard the gospel, it's okay, let them go. Don't push for a phony decision. You've done what God has asked you to do. You've had the privilege of the process of presenting the gospel. I hope you'll pray for them, meet them again, befriend them, love them, but it's our Father who's in control from beginning to end. How do I know somebody's yes is from their heart? I don't, but what I wanna make sure is that I have presented the gospel with integrity, meaning the use of the scriptures, making sure they understand who they violated, what they violated, their importance of the cross, turning to Jesus singularly for solution to be covered by his blood, and then turning from their sin and walking with Christ. As long as I have presented those elements, they can say yes. Sometimes I've seen yes with buckets of tears. Sometimes I've seen it with little or no emotion. But a day, a year, when the fruit is just flowing, then I know the conversion was real. Otherwise, words are basically can be meaningless. I get often asked, Bill, what in the world do you do when you see someone come to the Lord Jesus Christ? How do you follow up? Well, that's one of the joys of my life because I am a believer in the local church. I am a believer of the ministry of the local church, the purpose of the local church. And so my first concern, let's take two examples. One, I'm in my own town and I have the privilege of sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and someone receives it. Well, my first instinct is if they live in proximity of my church, of course I have a bias. I'm gonna send them to my church. I love my church. I love my pastor. If they live in another part of town, I'm personally convinced that I don't want someone driving 25 miles across town to get plugged into a family. And because I think the church is an important family of God and we need the fellowship of other believers. So the first thing I say to them is, by the way, now that you are a believer, see this is no longer a choice, God says you need to be involved in a local fellowship and I'd like to help you get started. Do you, by the way, have any preference whether it's a large or a small church? Most of the time they will tell me, no. I'll say, good, let me make a couple of calls and I'm going to have a couple of pastors contact you within the next 48 hours. If I happen to be in town, I will take them myself to that church so they don't walk in alone. The other thing I wanna make sure that happens is that the church I contact understands that they're not gonna just call them and say, by the way, our service time is at 11 o'clock. They're going to have someone call them, possibly go by their house that week, meet them at the front door, sit with them in the pew. Because we gotta remember that the church for a non-believer can be a pretty intimidating place until they realize the love, the warmth, and the power of the Holy Spirit that can be present in that church because I don't want to see someone just make a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want them to see the power of God as he changes their life in the sanctification process so they can begin to tell others about our Savior. All right, so uh, what did you like about that segment? think follow-up is important? Amen. Amen. Because the commission is not just to Amen. give them the gospel, um, but to teach them and, uh, and baptize them and, and to enfold them in a local church. I mean, you know, we, um, it, it, if they get saved and then we just leave it at that, 
it's like a baby being abandoned. And that baby needs growth and teaching and fellowship and encouragement. And uh, that's why that follow-up process is so, so vital. Um, do you like that why principle? You know, so just you just want to know why. If they're not ready, why? Um, and uh, try to um, ascertain if it's a, a, a legitimate concern. And, and sometimes people aren't ready. Remember, one of the first things he said in this video series was people have to hear the gospel an average of 7.6 times before they come to Christ. That's an average. Some people get saved the first time they hear it. Others may not until a lot longer than that. Uh, I didn't get saved the first time I heard the gospel. Uh, Louis came to his, uh, our apartment and shared the gospel with me. Then I, uh, I, when Kathy and I got married, uh, we got married and went to a little Southern Baptist church for a couple of weeks. And finally we said, we're not getting anything out of this. Let's not go. But I'm sure in that time I heard the gospel. I heard it and maybe it didn't uh, um, really resonate in my heart at that point. And then my sister invited me to go to faith and uh, Kathy and I. And so we didn't get saved the first time you know, we heard the gospel. Um, so sometimes people need to have repeated exposure to that. Um, maybe, maybe our job there is just to plant a seed. Maybe it's just to water. Um, but God's the one who gives the increase. And I like what he emphasized there that, you know, the last thing we want to do is have a false profession. Uh, we're not there to get another notch on our gun belt, if you know what I'm saying. That's, that's God, the Holy Spirit's job. Um, all right, so um, we have one more segment that's only about four minutes, and uh, it's kind of the closing of this set, uh, section, uh, session three. And then right after that, we're going to have Brother Steve come up and tell you a little bit about this uh, New Testament that you have. Maybe you already have one, but for those of you who don't, uh, and you, uh, you got a copy of this New Testament, um, some of the ways that the Gideons use these in their witnessing ministry. So we'll watch this final segment. It's about four minutes, and then we'll have Brother Steve come up. Nothing excites me more than to hear from people who are sharing Jesus without fear. You're going to hear some examples from people just like you who are doing it. I get a tremendous joy and peace um, when I have the few times shared my faith and actually had someone right there in front of me accepted the Lord. It is just a tremendous, like I said, joy, peace, elation, and uh, uh, confidence that I have obeyed the Lord. It's a sense of um, well done. Uh, my good and faithful servant by the Lord. And that's something that I've never felt before because I've been very um, reluctant to share my faith. As, as many Christians are when they first get started out, and I've been a Christian for a while, and we get fed by milk, it's time for me as an individual to stand up and, and learn to eat meat and stand up to profess my faith to all those around me uh, and not be so worried about what they're going to think. Uh, to be a true Christian and, and to express true, true faith, you're going, to lose, you're going to lose some friends along the way. Um, people are going to alienate, alienate themselves from you. But I can't worry about that because on Judgment Day, I want to be able to stand up uh, and be able to know that I gave it, I gave it all I had uh, in this world. And I can't wait. Once, once uh, I pass away, it's too late. I've got to do what I can now to change people's lives. I understand that, that the Holy Spirit is, is the main player, and I have a role to play, but that I know that the Spirit is working in them in ways that I can't see. And it's my job to, to share what I know in my heart, to share the truth of the gospel of Christ, and not rely on my own strength or my own understanding, and understand that the Holy Spirit is taking my words and applying it to their life in a way that I can't see. So I have to depend on the Holy Spirit knowing that, that in some cases I will say things that they won't understand, and the Bible tells us that. But that's not my job. My job is to share and to trust that God's working in their life and to pray for them. And these follow-up questions are great because they just review all the scriptures you've just shared with them. And the first question is, do you believe you're a sinner? And everybody in that place that day said yes. Do you want forgiveness of your sins? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you? and that his death and blood paid for your sin. Well, yeah, I believe that. 
And then the final question is the one that most Christians are afraid to ask. And that's the question, would you like to invite Jesus Christ into your life? And that day, it was, it was just a, a reminder of God's saving grace. There were three people who accepted Jesus Christ for the first time. There were another three who recommitted their hearts to Christ that day. And there was one that is, I'd say maybe he's like at a six or seven on the scale of, of, of being ready. Where would I be if someone had not talked to me at one point and opened their mouth and shared with me the good news of Jesus Christ? If they had been silent and not taken the opportunity when I was ready, when God had me prepared, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying that God's plan would have been thwarted, but uh, that person would have missed a great thrill of seeing this young boy uh, come to Jesus Christ. Well, the same thing with me is that I don't necessarily feel called to go out and shout it, but I need to be available to those people that God brings into my life and that I have a relationship to, to speak to them about what is so real and is so, um, has changed my life and makes my life worth living. In Matthew 28, it says, go ye into all the world. And when he said ye, he meant me. We need to go and tell people. And I've had people to say, well, how do you know that these people meant what they prayed? I said, there's no way I know. God said for me to tell them and leave the results to him. And that's what I have to do. So, uh, this is Brother Steve King, you know, Steve and Sue. Whoa. And, uh, yeah, hello. Did anybody not get a New Testament? Everybody's got one? I'm Steve King. I'm Ben a Gideon. Uh, oh, is there? I've been a Gideon for over 10 years. Les Clark's been a Gideon. How many years, Les? 23. Only 23. Started when he was 19. Bruce's been a Gideon for quite a while, too. So, anyway, uh, we have. Bill Face shared that he wrote a version of the book specifically for the Gideons, and we all get it when we join the Gideons. But uh, one of the things that I noticed with this, and you noticed it too, you can't share Jesus without starting a conversation, correct? The Gideons have been talking about starting a conversation with people for years, and so it's a natural thing. We all like to talk to at some point in time, but you have to talk to people, even if they're strangers. And uh, one of the things that, that I do is obviously start a conversation. And sometimes those conversations are not going to be very long. Everything Bill Fay has shared with us is very, very good if you have the time and the place to sit down with somebody and go through the entire presentation. But... If you're talking to somebody in a checkout lane or maybe a waitress when you're, they, she brings you the, the bill or something like that, uh, you just don't have the time to go through this, do you? Entirely. Well, there's a way that you can put God's word in their hands. Can God work through God's word? Can the Holy Spirit work through God's word? So it's very cool. In the front of all of your... All of your uh, New Testaments, you'll find a helps page. If we can flash that up on the screen, I think we can. But if you'll turn just about page three, I think it is in, the, in your New Testament, literally do it right now. You'll see help in times of need. And what I do, I do this sometimes once, twice, three times a day with these New Testaments. I, uh, I've, I'll run into somebody, and there was about two weeks ago, I left the Wednesday night service here, 
and I wanted to go find black licorice. Does anybody know why I wanted to find black licorice? Are there any doctors in the house? Medicinal. Medicinal. It wards off viruses. I was told by a doctor, it wards off viruses. There's a chemical in the black licorice. So I went from here over to Colony, and I went to Publix. And I'm looking at the candy aisle, and there's no black licorice. And so while I'm there, this young kid comes up that works there, and I said, I can't find the black licorice. And he looks, and he says, it should be right there, and it's empty. He says, let's look up at, in the front. We go up to the front, because what do they put up there on the checkout aisles? Candy that you pick up before you check out. We look, and there's no black licorice. So I turned to him, and I asked him, I said, do you go to church anywhere? And he says, no. And for whatever reason he gave me, I don't even remember what he said. But I just pulled out my New Testament, and I opened it to the front, and I said, in the front of this New Testament, I really, I didn't go through the Bill Fay questions. You can't do that with somebody that's working on a job, okay? So I just pulled it open, and I said, in the front of this New Testament, there's some helps. Like if you're anxious, afraid, depressed, whatever the case might be, there's, it tells you what scripture to read, and then what page it's on. If I ask you, if you talk to anybody today, if they're anxious at all, are they anxious about COVID? Is there anybody that's not anxious about that? Well, most people are. But if I told you to anxiety, you can find it. I think the solution to that, what's your Bible say? Under anxiety. What page? Page 11. So all you have to do is turn to page 11. And I'm assuming that most people can go through the numbers. But anyway, does anybody have page 11 and have anxiety, Matthew 6, 31? Have you got it? Somebody, oh, you can't see it? That's what these glasses are for. Who's got Matthew 6, 31 on page 11? Read it to me. And then verse 33. Okay, so what are we supposed to do so that we're not anxious to always seek God's, do the things that God wants us to do? And he told us to go and share. So if we focus on serving God, you don't have time to be anxious about anything. Okay, but in that situation... I showed him those. He didn't even respond because this guy, this kid is working. And then I flipped to the back. Now go to the back. Flip to the back there. And on the back of your New Testament, on the inside, right there, it has God's plan of salvation, what I call God's plan of salvation. God loves you. And the verse that we use there is John 3.16. And I just showed it to him. I said, these are the verses you know, where you can trust Christ, he paid the price for your sin, and you may know John 3.16. If anybody knows a verse in the Bible, it's going to be John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, I, and then I gave him the New Testament and I walked away. I told him about like, going to Grace Bible Baptist Church on Lewis Road, and we walked out, I walked out of the store. I can't take 10 minutes while this kid is working, to share the gospel with him, it's not fair to his employer. You follow me? So the New Testament gives you, with the helps, will give you an opening to talk to somebody. And there, I can't think of anybody that's ever said, no, they didn't want this when I've showed it to them. Because as soon as they see that help section, they get really excited. And then the plan of salvation back there. And obviously some of the same verses that Bill Fay was using and pastors mentioned, if you go right down there, all are sinners, there's Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then it's Romans 3.10, as it's written there, there's none righteous, no, not one. God's remedy for sin, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then you can move on down there in the interest of time. I'm going to move quick. But all may be saved now. There's Romans 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The same verses Bill Fay was talking about are right there. And then there's a sinner's prayer. But I put this in his hand. 
can God, can, this, can somebody look at this later on when they have time and God can use it? How many times, I don't know how many testimonies I've heard of people going into a hotel, picking up a Gideon Bible, reading some verses, and committing their life to God, accepting Jesus. We don't have to speak it to them all the time, but if we have the opportunity, we can. These New Testaments uh, are $1.75 each, and there's a way that you can buy these too. But we have 200 of them uh, that we've gotten for the church. Um, and I wanted to share something. I wanted my, I have a grandson. Go to the third one that shows my grandson, Jacob. He's 12. What do you see in the picture? There's a box of New Testaments there. When he was 11 last, this last year, one of the things you learn about me, Pastor, I cry a lot, but um, we, we went, this is up in Indiana, and he's seen me share the, share the New Testaments a lot of times. After church one Sunday, uh, his mom and his sister and, and he and, and Sue and I went out to Culver's for lunch. His dad does the IT work at our church. So he stayed behind at church for a little while. And so when you go to Culver's, you order your food, and then what do you do? You go sit down, and then how do you get your food? They bring it to you. We're sitting in this... I mean, Culver's is full. We're sitting there, and this kid comes by, and he's got our food, and he's looking for our number, and he comes to our table. And I turned to my 11-year-old grandson, and I said, you're up. I handed him a New Testament and said, you're up. He was expecting me to share the helps in the front and the plan of salvation in the back. And that young man stood up, and shared that New Testament like I had trained him to do it. And he, all he'd done is see me do it numerous, numerous times. A simple thing of just sharing the helps in the front and then going to the back, the plan of salvation, and handed it to the other young man. We serve a mighty God. We don't have to be perfect. He takes an 11-year-old boy, and that boy will stand up in a restaurant and offer the New Testament, God's word, to that kid. A lady came up from the table behind us. She goes to church somewhere else, and she told us how proud she was to see him do that. I ordered him 25 New Testaments. Friend of the Gideon's New Testaments. They have no Gideon emblem on them. We went golfing a little while after that, a couple days after that. We would go golfing. And on the first, first fairway, he hits the ball. And he gets out there, and I said, well, what have you got in your pockets? You know, because his shorts are, got those cargo shorts. He says, some New Testaments. I said, Jacob, put them in the golf cart. If we run into somebody that needs them, we can get it out of the golf cart. It's interfering with you swinging the club. This is how much he's interested in it. I was on the phone with him today, and I said, have you done anything with the New Testaments lately? He said, yeah, I gave out three of them. He's really into Taekwondo. I gave out three of them, two to two black belts and one to one brown belt. These are guys that are better than he is. And he says, I just started a conversation with him and went through the New Testament with him. And I said, what did you say to him? Did you ask him where they go to church? And he said, no. And didn't the Bible say we can learn from the little children? He says, no. I says, what do you usually do on Sunday? And my jaw dropped on the phone. What a way to start a conversation with anybody. What do you do on Sunday? What are they going to tell you? They're either going to church or they're doing something, they're, whatever it is. But what do you do on Sunday? And that's how a 12-year-old boy starts a conversation to give New Testaments. 
to people he doesn't really know. So that's something I'm going to start using is how to, is what do you do on Sunday? Uh, when I left here Saturday, Bruce, after our, our get meeting, I went to have my oil changed down here in Colony at the tire, whatever it's called. And I thought, well, I'm going to give a New Testament to somebody. And the, the assistant manager there, we had time to talk because it wasn't real busy. I don't know why God didn't have it busy that day. But we started to talk. And, uh, and I thought, how am I going to get into this conversation? And before I know it, he mentions that he grew up as, in a Catholic school. And I says, oh. I said, I grew up in a, in a, in a church. And we got baptized as, as children. He says, so did I. And I said, I went through catechism class when I was 13. He says, oh, so did I. And I said, but I didn't know Jesus. And he stopped right there, you know. And I said, you know, if you were to die, I told him that I got saved when I was 30, on my 30th birthday, I accepted Christ. And I, and I said, and I asked him, I said, uh, well, if you were to die and go to heaven, why should Jesus let you into heaven? And he said, because I'm a good person. And I said, well, I never knew how many good things I had to do or how many bad things would keep me out of heaven. And you could just see his eyes just stop. You know, he'd never thought about that. And I said, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, for by grace you're saved through faith, not of your own doing, not of works, lest any man should boast. I says, it's not our works that gets us into heaven. It's faith in Jesus Christ. And John 3 tells us that we must be born again. Not we should be, but we must be born again. We have to have a spiritual birth. And I could just see his, his whole demeanor. He was very friendly. But all of a sudden, somebody had said to him that what he was believing by God's word was not accurate. And I told him where we go to church, and I gave him the New Testament. I showed him a couple verses in the back. Then I paid for my oil change and left. But there's plenty and plenty of opportunities, and I'll quit now because I know it's time. But use this to get people's interest on the helps and then God's plan of salvation. Write down friends of Gideon's. Write it down. If you've got a pen or pencil, write down friends of Gideon's. Friends of Gideon's, you can go to the website, just type it in, boom, go to it. It costs nothing. You can become a friend of Gideon's and just put your information in there. You get a free New Testament and some other literature from the Gideon's, but you can buy these New Testaments in quantity, just like I did for Jacob. I have a friend of the Gideon's back in Indiana that buys these 50 at a time. So I don't care how many you buy, or if you want me to buy them, or if you want Les to buy them, or if you want Bruce to buy them. You know, if we're Gideon's, we can buy them also. But friend of Gideon's, you can order as many as you'd like, as much as you'd like, as much as Jesus gives you the opportunity to hand them out. Or you can just use these New Testaments that we have for you and just mark them up and just use them but not give them out. But I prefer to give them out and put God's word in their hands. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Okay. I have a lot of fun doing this. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Amen. And uh, you'll notice, too, in the front of this New Testament, very front cover, it says, this is not to be sold, this book not to be sold. And uh, now my wife and I are thrift store junkies. Anybody else a thrift store junkie? I, can't, I cannot pass up a thrift store if I have time to go in. And you'll find a number of times thrift stores, you'll find these, and they say not to be sold. So I'll say, you know, and, and a lot of thrift stores have a section where they have Bibles. They just give them away. We were at a, a thrift store in uh, Tennessee when we were up there the last time we were in Tennessee, went to a thrift store. And believe it or not, they had not just New Testaments like this. I mean, they have get, people turn these in sometimes and you can just get them for free at a thrift store. I mean, you know, recycle them, right? They're recycled. But I like the idea of getting these new ones. But for $1.75, what an investment, right? You can't beat that. But, you know, sometimes they have these. And in this particular thrift store, they had an old Schofield Bible. And I said, 
how much is this? She goes, oh, the Bibles are free. I said, thank you very much. I'll take it. Because my old Schofield Bible is literally falling apart. And um, it's a, a couple of teenage boys got me when I was youth director back in uh, the mid-70s. And it's just completely devastated. It's just the paper's all shredded, and it's just the backs and everything's, the leather's even falling apart. And so I was really glad to get, but, you know, that's just a little thing. Sometimes you go to the thrift store, you'll find these, um, and most of the time they're free. And if, they're, if they say, well, you know, it says, well, it says it's not to be sold. Okay, you can have it. And uh, so, uh, you know, again, God's word does the convicting, and the Holy Spirit's power is the one who does the converting. Amen? And so, uh, uh, thank you. And, and, and so those, uh, if you, we have some of these left over, um, if uh, they, they can just take them. If any, anybody wants, anybody wants to take a couple? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Give it away and we'll replace it, right? Give it away and we'll replace it. Uh, so Brother Steve will be back there. If you have any questions, um, see Steve and uh, see Les, Les the Gideon, Bruce the Gideon. Um, I, I'd love the fact that the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so, uh, again, you know, uh, we, we can talk about living a good life and being a good example and all of that, you know, being a good neighbor and being, you know, a, a good employee. And, 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 and I find that's fine. I think we should do that. In fact, if we don't do that, then we're really not an example to people. But people don't get saved because they see a good life. People get saved because they hear the word of God. So they need this. They need this message, don't they? All right, next week we'll conclude this series, part four, and we'll kind of pull together all the loose strings, and I think it'll, uh, it'll all make a little more sense. So appreciate you being here tonight. Um, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the fact that you have chosen us and ordained us to be your ambassadors and uh, Lord, we're simply um, there to tell others what you can do for them and because you did it for us. Um, thank you for the encouragement that this series has already been to so many. And I pray, God, that you would use this to help us be better prepared as your witnesses to be available to be used by you and that God you would give us those opportunities and you will when you see we are ready to avail ourselves of them that we have prepared ourselves to be used by you thank you for what you're going to do thank you again Lord for this time tonight Pray that you would be with us as we go into this week and help us to be ready to give an answer to all those who ask a reason for the hope that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. God bless you.